Welcome to the Judgment Call podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet, risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind bogglers. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp4u.com, mtp for you.com to start your 30 day free trial. I'm very happy today to have Peter Borders here with me. And uh, Peter is a serial entrepreneur, executive investor, mentor, and advisor for a lot of companies. He currently runs Trajectory Capital, his VC business, as well as True West and my main block. And hopefully he's going to tell us more about those. Welcome to the Judgment Call podcast. Peter, it's great to have you. Great to be here, Torsten. Th thank you. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. Same here. Uh, brought a proper background just for you. <laughs> I hope it's not distracting. Sounds good. <laughs> um, so, 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 you know, this show is about risk takers and um, we people who, who risk their life, their reputation, their money on a somewhat contrarian idea that they had. And when I went through your, your LinkedIn profile, but also the things you told me in our last conversation, you know, we, we definitely share this never ending curiosity, this ADD for something else that comes around that might be more exciting than the old thing. And there's always something else to explore. I definitely have that. And uh, I wonder what was the first time you discovered that? When did you kind of go towards this trajectory where you felt like, oh, I really see myself as a serial entrepreneur. I see as someone who, you know, keeps exploring, goes into this curiosity driven life and career that you've been um, going so far. Uh, when did you first feel that? And how do you get started? No, that's such a, I was just thinking about that question because I was thinking about how far it goes back. I mean, I've been an entrepreneur ever since I was very young. I had a commercial fishing business in the summers that I, did um, I've just always asked a lot of questions and never really taken things for what you see is what you get. But I think the the biggest inflection point for me in my career and really you know starting to have that understanding of my curiosity was in my junior year at uh, college when I ended up doing an internship for. Uh, my, my big love of my life has always been digital, you know, media, digital media, advertising, and, and then soon, you know, anything digital transformation driven. But when I did that internship, it really opened my eyes up, blew, blew my brains apart in the way I was thinking about things because I learned, I basically I went to my father who was an entrepreneur and I he said, well, how was your experience? And I said, I don't know if I want to stay in school. He goes, and he's like, well, you know, he's the classic, you go here and then you go here and then you're going to go to grad school, that old kind of career path trajectory. And so I just flushed three quarters of 
my entire education down the toilet. I learned so much. And not only did I learn so much, I learned that there's uh, a huge disparity between what I'm getting out of my education and who I am and what I'm really interested in. Because the, uh, the, while the education is teaching you discipline and focus, it opened my eyes up to this incredible infinite realm of possibility that I think about that's out there. And that was really the, the inflection point uh, that started it all for me. Um, and then it just was there was that like a conscious decision, um, a conscious uh, decision for you, or that kind of just came along and kind of the facts presented themselves. And do you feel like you, you made this yourself, or kind of you you were drawn towards this way, and that there was not so much you could do um, about it? I think it's something that I innately have always had inside me. Um, it's just part of my my DNA, but it was an inflection point that really opened my my eyes up and my the, my conscious self that like oh my god look at this world and especially because i i and then on the other there's a interesting second part to that so then i ended up moving to europe you know working for two years i can my father was like what are you doing you know and i was like I, I i need to do this i need to go explore you know i know um and I came back from that, and then that even further accelerated because I came back and all my friends, who I love the pieces, you know, I grew up in New York City and then Princeton, New Jersey, you know, basically I looked at them and we lived in such an insular bubble. And even the way when I came back, you know, I've always been a person who's always asked a lot of questions, why, 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 why? You know, why is, why is that like that? Or, you know, always had this kind of more intuitive aspect of me, which of course is something that in the generation I grew up with, you know, guys weren't intuitive, but I always, I guess it's probably one of my big loves for the water and fishing, this kind of sixth sense connected to being able to see and understand things. But my wife is like, you see stuff in the water, I don't even know it's there. And it's also, I think, a reflection of this as well. But when I came back from that as experience overseas and looking at you know, you know, you go to Princeton Day School and in school they say, oh, you're going to do this. You're going to take the SATs. It's going to determine the rest of your career and your college. And then you go to there and then you're going to go to grad school and then you're going to get go work in investment banking. And then you're going to go get married and you're going to have 2.2 kids and 3.2 BMWs. And then you're going to move to Greenwich, Connecticut and you're going to be Doesn't happy. Sound so bad. Yeah, well, I, I looked at it. And I said, I don't think that's what I want. That's like there's this incredible world of things that were happening. And then the internet started to happen and that was the end, you know? Um, so I, 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 to answer your question, I think it's a bit of, you know, there are things that we're predisposed to, there are incidents that happen or moments that happen in our lives that open those possibilities of what we're kind of innately have in us. And, um, and those moments open my open my kind of conscious being up to like this is who I am, this is what I'm interested in, and it's just kind of become a, a way of life. I'm like you, I'm just perpetually curious. There's always got to be a better way. There always has to be something new, and especially when the world started to get to be you know become driven by technology, which was the infinite realm of possibility. I went to my father who was an entrepreneur. Is a great example of that. He was a in the radio and cable TV business, you know, started with, I mean, he was going to uh, put himself through Yale, you know, son, when I was your age, I bicycled barefoot through 12 feet of snow delivering newspapers to put myself through college, you know, like kind of one of those fathers. And then he was on his way to be a sociology professor in grad school at Columbia and his best friend said, hey, I just inherited $50,000. Let's go buy a radio station. And my dad said, get away, <laughs> I want nothing to do with that talked him into it and then had this in, incredible career, which was a big kind of foundation for me as an entrepreneur and what he built. But interestingly enough, when, when this started to happen for me and the, you know, the idea of digital transformation and technology trans, transforming, I was working in our family company, you know, looking at leading the digital side of taking broadcast radio and moving it into the digital realm. And I went and, and it, was, it was incredibly frustrating. Um, the, another lesson, you know, about um, being relentless, but also knowing when when is enough. Like I've beat my head against the wall. I better stop beating my head against the wall. Or I'm going to bleed to death. Um, and I remember speaking with him about it. I said, you, Dad, you got to take this seriously. 
you know, just like you had the foresight to see that AM radio was mono and he was buying up FM uh, radio licenses for like, you know, and cable licenses for $250. Uh, that you, and there wasn't even a, a way to listen to it. You had the foresight to see that that was stereo. Now this is the next natural progression and extension. You know, it's XM, it's pushing and pulling and metrics. And now we've got our local audiences, our national and global, you know, because ultimately in the radio business or content company, radio is just going to become one of those mechanisms um, to be able to reach them. And I, I guess that's probably one of the, the third inflection point that really pushed me, catapulted me into you know how I got where I am today because after deciding that that wasn't going to happen, I ended up leaving and founded a, an investment bank that I ran for 12 years in the boom, boom days of the internet, helped found a bunch of companies and really started to get you know, knee, knee deep in that first big wave of, of digital transformation. That, that was, that was really kind of the, probably the third catalyst that really pushed my trajectory into, you know, the way, the way that I think and look at the world today, like, you know, like we've talked about before. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think this is something we, we, we all share this, this curiosity gets us started, but, but, but I feel, I don't know if this was true for you, but to an extent, there is this cross-pollination. You come from one industry and you have a certain set of learnings um, that could be you know, very hard um, or things that went easy in another industry. You come to another industry and feel like, whoa, I can just apply this. So it's not rocket science necessarily. They say most people in Silicon Valley, they go there to steal ideas or that they've already stolen. They raise money on it and then they bring it to the rest of the population. That's kind of the, the adoption cycle that they start. It's not necessarily that they come with a big innovation that they came up with. Like MP3 is probably a good example for this, which um, was invented in Germany, but popularized mostly in the US um, and then went into file sharing. So what, what, what I'm trying to say is entrepreneurs are often drawn to a new project because it's easy. It feels easy. Customers kind of keep calling you and they're interested in it. And it's not just... Obviously, we all want to make money, but it's it's also this, you can get closer to fulfill your potential. And we all don't really know where our potential is. We, we don't really know what, what we're supposed to do in life, what our purpose is. Other people seem to have a better idea of that when they look at us. But I, for instance, had a trouble with this, figuring this out, even through the reflection, talking to other people. Um, what I felt is as an entrepreneur, it, it kind of makes life easier, to be honest. Um, it's really emotionally a big toll, but it, it gets you to try out a lot of stuff. And sooner or later, you find something you're really good at. And that's determined mostly by you, obviously also by a lot of luck, right? We all went and lived through the internet bubble where everything was suddenly going up and it was a huge yeah. bull market. But it gives you a lot of bigger room to find something you're really good at. Did you feel that was a big advantage for you too? Or you thought like, hmm, that uh, would have been easier to, to, it didn't fit me, but it would have been easier a traditional career. I think, uh, I think I would struggle in any form of a traditional career now knowing myself to that point. I, I, and there, I've learned to kind of, I don't want to say bucket people, but they're people who think more one-dimensionally, two-dimensionally or three-dimensionally. And the people who, just like to go work at Time Warner. I've got a great job. Here's my career path. This is where I'm going. There are the others then who can do that, but have the ability to have some form of kind of entrepreneurial aspect to innovate within that. And then to me, there's there's the next iteration of that, which are which we talked about in our original discussion, you know, about the people who are um, able. You know, I, I think being a true entrepreneur is someone who can understand that they're literally patterns around us everywhere and has that kind of intuitive curious sense to be able to question that and see them and then be able to identify the patterns understand them and then act on them and i really find those are kind of the pillars of a great entrepreneurs do so whether you're trying multiple many different things until you find that or not you know i i think it goes back to that interesting question that you were asking about like is it innately something that we're born with or do you learn or do you kind of have that gene? Are you predisposed to it? Because certainly when I started my path, you know, I, everything that I learned in school had absolutely nothing to do with what I was doing, you know, so much so that 
when I was building one of my companies, we were going in you know, three years, we went from over a you know, million in sales to 70 million going at a hyper trajectory. We were just trying to learn and figuring shit out in real time. But there was no playbook. There was nothing in school. There was no education. There was no the mentoring the you know networks didn't exist today, and you're literally working in real time trying to figure things out. And it's um, and I I think most of the people who are more predisposed to that, you know, one or two dimensional. I don't mean that in any kind of derogatory sense. It's just the way that you know we function and our brains function as both you know as humans and and understanding what happiness to us. They can't operate in that kind of environment, you know. And they're yeah. and one and then two, they're just not curious. They just want to have that stable consistency. You know, they are not going to run through walls. I mean, as you know, in, in entrepreneurialism, you have to, you know, the, the best thing you can do is fail. You know, most people think failure is failure. It's probably one of the, I love failure. <laughs> it's, uh, it's it only what, you know, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Um, it is the Silicon Valley mantra now, right, to, to fail quickly. And it used to be the by that they mean 18 months. And I think by now it means three months. And it's probably going to be two weeks where I assume and ready you, you with these scalable platforms where you deploy things uh, where, where you have a global audience instantly. So you, you very quickly realize if this is a success or not. And, and I fully agree with you. Failing gives you a lot of lessons. You kind of don't want to fail in the sense of Theranos, right? Or in the sense of where you raise $2 billion and then you're like, like Hebe, Quibi, um, the, um, the TV um, subscription service that was primarily yeah. to be run on cell phones and people realize, oh, well, we, we also want to watch it on a TV and it never really took off a stiff competition from Hulu and Netflix. So I feel like you want to fail, but you want to fail in the, in the sense of that's that's limited as a there's a there's a wall around it you don't want to feel super public that's kind of embarrassing even in silicon valley still yeah and then and then to your point about risk taking that's a whole nother kind of layer when i think about the stack of entrepreneurialism and the startup world and um and the ability to to to, to say there's got to be a better way and i'm going to do whatever it takes to fe- to to prove that and to be able to take those calculated kind of as best as you can risks in, in proving whether it works or not. And then, you know, once you get traction, then there's there's so many other different things that need to be able to happen. You know, I found that the, the um, and actually I'm going to write a book one day about this called Founder Syndrome or the Little Napoleon Syndrome about mm-hmm. what makes good, good companies great, you know, and how do you go from a startup in an idea to starting up to building a scalable organization and miss all those failure points, you know, that people have when their your ego becomes your biggest detractor or the, you know, the, the things that we don't learn, even, even in a, a lot of the, um, there were a couple of guys I mentored that went through Y Combinator and a lot of the Teal programs. And I kept asking, I said, so tell me about your experience there. Heads down, heads down, talk to your customer, you know, build, build, build MVP, get the demo day, and get as get much money. And I said, okay, and then what? So what if it works? How do you, how do you get from three guys and money from demo day to building a company with 300 people and five offices globally? Do you, does anyone talk to you about how to do that? Absolutely not. I was like, well, that's a huge, like, it's very, wow, very Silicon Valley, right? You, you pretty, build it and they will come. Yeah, it's 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 uh, kind of the idea. You build some network infrastructure, some tool, and then you hope for the best. Some bigger company will buy you. I think that's that's been working well for a lot of VCs. So they, that's kind of what they're looking for. And I listened to a talk from Brian Chesky, the the founder, one of the co-founders of Airbnb, and I felt you you can see it immediately that that he has something that takes you beyond just build it. Like he came out of Y Combinator as well, but he was one of the rare success stories at that scale. Um, they have a lot of success stories, but not a lot of huge IPOs. Yeah. And what you can see immediately just talking to him for like, or like listening to him for 10, 15 minutes is how much of an of a ego and how much of a, of a quick, let's do this, this and this with a with a, you know, good mix of, of extroversion and introversion that he brings to the table. And you can see that's different than most people, developers who are part of Y Combinator. So I found him probably the exception, and it has had to be proven right. But 
or yeah. did prove right. The question is, um, can others replicate that success? And I, I think I want to get your opinion on this because I'm, I feel I'm, I made up my mind already. The current environment where we see a lot of startups don't go anywhere. They, they, they have trouble scaling to a valuation half a billion dollar or a billion dollars. And then we have the investments by the vision fund. And often those are minimal rounds, 100, 200 million dollars um, per investment, often up to a billion dollars or, or beyond that. And then just vision fund vehicles seem to go IPO. Everyone else seemed to have trouble to get to that stage, get to the valuation that um, makes you of interest to, to public markets and to investment banks who can get you public. I feel like there was something broken for the last 10 years. I don't know if it's changing now. Maybe Bitcoin is going to change that or crowdfunding is going to change that. But I feel there's a real misconnect between what most of the entrepreneurs actually want, which is a meritocracy. So everyone has access to the same resources and we, we decide our fate by talking to customers, by talking to investors in a pretty level playing field. And I feel this wasn't true for the last 10 years. It was more like the old boys' connections who made the IPOs and the big payouts for most entrepreneurs as well as investors work. How, how do you see that? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I couldn't agree with you more. It's still that way, even though with crowdfunding and things, I mean, there are some success stories, but it's still that old boys network. And I, I think that's going to be very tough, tough to democratize, um, you know, and outside of, you know, companies really learning to not become so dependent on raising large amounts of capital, but really more focusing on operating, you know, exceptional operations and, how you can build a business and get it to being, you know, you hear all those stories about, oh, I built this in the garage and I only raised a million dollars and I, you know, got it to EBIT, to EBIT prof, you know, profitability. And then I grew it from there. I think the, the, the problem in doing that is again, there's not a lot of education or let alone even a software kind of platform that helps you move through those different stages and cycles to be able to operate efficiently. Everybody's just trying to go you know, go quickly and go fast. And then of course you get stuck in that, there's so much seed money and then you get stuck in that choke point of the A round because how do I get into that club? You know, how do I stand out? And I think that kind of human sociological aspect is gonna be one of the last things that really changes. I mean, I, I do believe it's possible. I mean, we're certainly seeing it. You know, I think about the world that business cycles that my father lived in, they were massive and methodically you know, um, long cycles. He was, you know, protected by the FCC. I know I've got all my radio stations in Philadelphia. I've got minimal competition. Uh, and what I was interesting was as digital transformation started to happen and I started seeing that cycles around him speed up and also that controlled FCC broadcast radius getting broken apart and becoming fragmented you know, uh, some interesting learnings were for me watching how he dealt with that. If you think about the trajectory, like you were talking about today, that companies go through, I mean, it's absolutely remarkable, you know, comparatively just even 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. And I, I actually wonder one time, at one time when we're going to see what I think of as the right angle business model where someone will build a product, launch it, uh, you know, and sell it three months later for $2 billion because, you know, now we can go to one to one to many globally so rapidly versus the way that I think that the traditional, you know, broadcast business or even think about how records were distributed before MP, MP3s, right? You had to go to market to market and get every radio station to start to play your record. It was very, you know, lengthy rollout, you know, whereas now you can go one to many almost instantaneously. Um, and those are the businesses and those are the kind of cycles that are going to start to change that because you're not going to need to raise the kind of capital that you'll need to be able to get that hockey stick trajectory, which works for some, but in others, like, you know, when you hear the WeWork stories and things like that, it's, you know, it's kind of a broken, I think of a broken long-term model. Yeah, there's, 
there, there's a lot of attention for the uh, the actual unicorns or that the ones that are in the IPO pipeline that usually get that kind of investment and then sooner or later go IPO and then you know Airbnb just got a hundred billion dollar market cap which is ginormous uh, it's bigger than many hotel chains maybe they deserve it so I think Airbnb is one of my favorites in this recent crop but there's a lot of hypey, not sustainable business models from my point of view that go IPO, get a lot of attention, get great valuations. But there's a lot of companies in between that nobody has heard of that should deserve way more attention, have great business models, great profit margins, very low capital raising. And in between something went wrong and then you lived through the dot-com boom, me too, where, where we had these companies go from an idea to a billion dollars within a few weeks. and. Uh, without without any real business, um, just as a shot at a future market. And that was certainly the other extreme in this. And uh, do you think the next 20 years will look more like what we've just seen or there will be something that's more democratic? Because I think there's a lot of tools, but there's not a lot of mass adoption, there's not a lot of trust from the public in these pre-IPO companies. Because how do I measure them? What valuation will they get? That everyone is just looking for, okay, where is the next hype going to be? And they, they just want to surf that wave. And they know these companies really don't matter. and They're kind of crap. That, that's kind of my gut feeling. Even do there's some great companies, obviously, in that pool as well. Do you think it's going to be similar or there's something out there that's, that's really a game changer? You know, I, it's going to be, I think it's going to be similar. It's very tricky because to your point, it's about adoption. And then also because we're going to go again in one of these cycles and it, it'll be different than the bubble because there are great companies that are out there with real businesses. But, you know, when you look at the multiples that are happening right now, they're, they're crazy. But you've got all these startup platforms where, you know, anyone can go and invest. Yeah. Few people will make some money. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people are going to get burned when there's a contraction <laughs> and, and then things will and then things will change. Um, I think it's so hard to democratize that because you know, if you look at the, I mean, the trajectory of transformation now is unprecedented. And that's what I mean. COVID has accelerated digital transformation at, a, at just such an incredible, unprecedented rate. Um, I mean, you know, long live the death finally of the industrial age. The digital, the age, you know, the digital age is truly, truly here. So. You know, we're going to go, we're going through another big cycle. And I think you're going to have, you know, these very large, um, you know, companies like Trade Desk or Airbnb that are these anchor kind of tenants in those verticals. And then what companies are going to need to decide, you know, it, it, along their life cycle is con they have to constantly keep checking, where am I? Where do I want to be? Where am I? Where do I want to be? Because there are certain points, and there's one company I'm an, an investor in now. You know, they they were looking at you know where we at a point where we need to get where we should be getting acquired, but then they were growing so fast they had to quickly change, and they did made the right decision. You know where they decided let's keep going. Now they're at the point where they're too big to get bought by anyone. They've got to go IPO, and I think that's one of the things. One of my, my I made that mistake of one of my uh, mistakes and early on as an entrepreneur. I got offered a hundred million dollars for a company. We were in a huge growth trajectory phase. And I said, look, I'm, we're very interested, but I just need to get one to two more quarters under my belt to finish the cycle out. And then I'd like to talk with you again. And then literally in the middle of the second cycle, you know, tw you know 2007 and the whole market started to cor you know, correct again. And I missed that window of opportunity. So um, I, I, I don't know. If, I think democratizing it's going to be it's going to be very tricky. Um, yeah. Probably the smartest thing is to be able to be at the forefront of these these giants, you know, looking at interesting opportunities that you know that the market's coming their market's coming towards them, and be able to build and be in front of them, and then use them as exit mechanisms versus going to the public companies. I, I mean, I just took a company public. Let me tell you, it is not for the faint of heart. Yeah, um, that? Uh, yeah. Which, which company was that? Uh, it's Cubian in the ad tech space. We have the uh, platform. It's a cloud-based marketplace called the Audience Cloud, mm -hmm. and it's a horizontal end-to-end -end marketplace. Um, solves a lot of problems within the industry. You know, the ad tech through digital transformation has become hyper, hyper fragmented and siloed. You know, between buyer and seller, there are far too many hops of people taking money out, which leaves tremendous opportunity for fraud to happen, which is a $42 billion global issue right now. Um, besides that, 
on the supply side, you know, by the time they get paid, publishers are getting killed because they're getting pennies on the dollar and it's very hard for them to have sustainable business models because it's so competitive now uh, on the supply side and on the demand side, you know, there's tremendous waste that's going on. Um, was it there was in the last three years, there was $42 billion worth of waste and ad spend and so by so building typically click fraud or what, what kind of waste is that oh my god there's so many different forms of fraud that are out there okay. click fraud you've got guys that have you know can build you know thousands and thousands of, why, why sell guns and dope when you can build thousands of websites offshore uh there were two years ago two um uh two russians that were taken down by the feds uh they were doing a million dollars a day and ad fraud. Wow. Um, and then one guy decided to throw the other guy under the bus. He lifted the curtain a little bit so the feds could see them. He lifted a little too much and they saw everything and they took it down. It's a very, very big problem that plagues the industry as along with waste and, and um, you know, so now, you know, we go through these cycles where you have this mass expansion, hyper fragmentation. And then I love what, you know, Seth Godin said a while ago, how now we need, like, it's like the Big Bang Theory. These next phases of cycles are about gravity and bringing things together and creating organization within that. And I think you're seeing that happening in the ad tech space today, which is one of the areas I'm extremely interested in, as well as um, other spaces as well. Or, as, you know, now we're seeing in the crypto space after we went through the first, you know, like the Internet. I love the first wave, but the business cycles I'm really interested in are the second wave because... That's when you get these real businesses, you know, where the Amazons and the Google AdSense start to emerge out of that second that second wave after that collapse. Um, and that's starting to happen. We're seeing it now in crypto, which is extremely interesting. Um, and we're going to see a lot of changes and consolidation there as, as well. But ad, ad tech's extremely interesting space right now. It's been dead for so long. And finally, ad tech 3.0 is here. But I mean, there's so much opportunity out there. It's, um, I love operating companies. I love building things. But one of the things that I love about being more on the venture side and not really being on the typical venture side, I like to get involved in companies and help help develop them as well. Not just being not being money is that I get to be able to touch so many different things. And you know, as we go back to the beginning of the conversation, you know, in this kind of infinite world of possibility that's out there. You know, the, the the notion of me being stuck in one space is not something that I <laughs> that I don't function well in, do, in doing that. I mean, it, it's just remarkable when ag ag tech, clean tech, blockchain, ad tech. There's so much transformation happening that, that right now. It's it's just remarkable. So when you when you when you. Sh- share your time between the different businesses that you run, that you're involved in, the, the investments you make. Uh, give me an idea how this works and what what companies in term, do you look for for trajectory right now? Is that something you, you see the opportunity when it's being presented to you or you go out actively and say, okay, I want to be in that market. Who is already in there? Who should I invite for, for the next funding round or an acquisition? Uh, how does this all work? Yeah, so it's very, it's opportunistic, and I'd say driven going back to that sixth sense intuition side of things. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like when I first met the founders of Triple Lift in the ad tech space, who are growing like wildfire right now, uh, they had just left AppNexus, which I love because they have an incredible culture. Going back to the operations side, you know, I'm very interested in you know, the next mob, PayPal mafia, double click mafia, those guys that are highly functional and know how to execute. So that's a really important pillar that I look for um, outside of the passion, uh, the addressable market, and then the idea. But, you know, for example, Triple Lift probably pivoted, I didn't say pivoted, but repositioned three times. They started in the uh, with the idea of the visual economy was starting to happen with Pinterest and there were no analytics, you know, that enabled you to really harness. I mean, at that time, Pinterest didn't even have any analytics. Harness that um, economy, which led to their building um, algorithms that can track images and associate analytics to it, um, which solving another bigger problem because, let's say, uh, Gucci produces 30,000 images a year. 
And they literally have a guy at that time named Enzo. And he sits there, oh, girls between 14 and 16 of this demo, Geo, you know, it's a this one, it's a this one, it's a this one. And what they started doing is using their ability to track those 30,000 images that you, you as an advertiser or content creator could crowdsource, well, actually, what is the most popular image based on this demo, Geo, whatever I'm feeding in, so that I'm always using the most popular image that's been crowdsourced. And then from there, it morphed even further into, okay, well, how do you apply it in native advertising? How do you apply it into, you know, now CTV? How do you apply it? And they've now just morphed into this incredible platform that really is truly this next generation, you know, technology-driven marketplace for advertisers creating, creating tremendous value. When they first started launching, you know, the first thing I start to look for is like, what's the data, 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 data? And all I needed to hear was, you know, one in four people who click on something at that time and Pinterest buy it. I was like, okay, you got me there. I come out of the performance marketing industry. That's an extraordinary, you know, return on a conversion rate. And the next was, you know, by using this visual mechanism, we can increase performance by 20% in, a, in all advertising. Uh, like literally, I was like, all right, how much? I'd like to invest with you guys. So I, those are the kind of themes that I like to I like to look for. And a lot of it is based on, I, I just love to talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, see what they're seeing, because they might see things in the market that I'm not seeing. And then I, you know, go do my own homework. And then from there, it, start, it starts from there and having, you know, a discussion. And, and it's anything from real estate to blockchain to ad tech. Um, you know, I, I really don't try and pigeonhole myself to any one particular theme. The theme I'm more, you know, really looking for is the team, their ability to perform the addressable market, what they're building, and then most, you know, importantly, are these guys able to not only execute, but under, you know, identify and understand, you know, when they have to keep evolving, because going back to those business cycles, things are moving so quickly, you know, doors are, and windows are opening and closing so quickly that, you know, going back to the triple lift side, they ran through one window and then another opened and then they all of a sudden veered right and they ran through another and they ran through another as they were finding the market. And that's a kind of a characteristic and trait that I like to find uh, in entrepreneurs who aren't so stuck in there. I'm in my box. I can't see anything else outside of what's in my, what's in my box. Um, those are, yeah. those are really important elements. I think in, in um, as far as you know, investing successfully and and for you know, being putting my operators hat on, you know, all my learnings from building building companies, ones that have been very successful, and others that have, you know, struggled or, you know, you know, were first at the open window, and then you know had tech teams that couldn't execute fast enough, and another company comes through the window and you know passes you and builds twenty million in revenues, you know, and you're stuck there, going like you guys. We you have to be more agile. You know, how do you do that? There, there, there is, I'm, I'm, one of my next projects actually I'm thinking about is a thing called Elemental Cloud. I want to build a platform that takes all the things that you don't learn in business school or at the accelerators and all the learnings from you know, the PayPal mafias, the double click mafias, the guys who are successful and actually put it into a process going back to what we were talking about before that helps remove those friction points because there is a formula to it, but there is no, and they're the tools to do it. You know, we now have Slack and Asana and all these different siloed mechanisms, but like, how do you put it into a comprehensive, easy to use platform that helps you take a company from what I call the four pillars from startup to starting up to scalable organization to an enterprise. And uh, that I think would that's, be fantastic. That's, that's one of the I, biggest I, failure points right now that I'm finding. It does not exist. So. I, I have the same impression. So the, the question then is how much of this is an, is an art or how much can be put into an, a quantitative analysis? Right. I, I guess it's probably both. And uh, be absolutely right. There isn't a lot of yeah. material you can easily access to. MIT, for instance, has a lot of um, their business school um, open um, courses online so you can access them. So there, there is material, but it's all over the internet. There's founder yeah. interviews, there's things that we do on the podcast, um, 
um, guests like you who are who are um, busy creating content. There's lots of stuff on Twitter, but it's not as concise. And I think that's also true for general investing. I've been uh, looking into a lot of more macro investing, um, forecasting trends, or giving my own prediction um, a better measure about how markets might move. And we have this big trend now with the Fed. We 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 have this reinflation trade going on. So, and there's a lot of investors who've seen those cycles before or like the first time into them. What, what, what I was trying to find out, how do I get started, A, from a purely analytical perspective, but B, also putting things in the algorithm like AI or just like any kind of algorithm. And I felt there's a lot of knowledge. There's, there's books. Nothing much happened in the book market, I feel, in the last 10 years. Nobody writes books anymore, wants to write books anymore because maybe it's not profitable. Nobody reads books anymore. But there's been a lot of content all over the internet that I found. But it's it's <laughs> difficult to come up with a with an aggregator because you kind of compete in marketing with all the original content. So how do you make the aggregator as successful in marketing as the original content? It's kind of like a, like a meta search company that um, and I ran one back in 2007, and we were competing with Expedia. But Expedia has this huge value chain. They can they can draw any user, and they've, they've been really good at that. They've gotten really good at this. And market it very and, and monetize it very successfully. So you compete with for this and the same marketing opportunities and waypoints with Expedia, and they say you can pay a dollar per click. But as Meta Search, you can only pay twenty cents per click. So I think this would be a similar problem. This is this is wonderful to aggregate that knowledge. But by the time you have it in a standardized format, uh, the industry consensus might have moved on, and it's all uh, outdated. And you got to go back to the original content. So, yeah. uh, GitHub solved it. Um, I, I, I think you have a have a good shot of of, of creating something similar. But it, <clears throat> creating that scale is really hard. I, I wouldn't have a good answer for it from from my point of view. I would pull that off. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it, there's no one has you know. So you just described. There's so many interesting bits and pieces, but there isn't really you know. And and they're the guys who figured it out. You know, like the PayPal or like the um, the example of the the great team at Triple Lift. Um, but it's you know, it's everything that you don't learn in school. You learn it in the trenches. But yet, you know, in my studying it and and having having both invested and operated in it there are constant themes that you can start picking up over and over again. And I'd say very similar to how Jim Collins was one of the, my favorite books when I was a earlier entrepreneur was good to great. And he studied their quantifiable themes within companies that became great, you know, good companies, but what made a great company. And I think that you can extract that base information. And again, going back to patterns and process, that can be applied basically, they're almost timeless um, and can be applied to almost any industry and in how do you grow a company? How do I take it from an idea? How do I prove that idea? How do I move from being a startup where, you know, we're wearing way too many hats and we're like cavemen in front of a cave just killing everything that goes in front of it to then becoming more metrics driven? How do I go to, you know, then how do I start removing hats? That's one of the bigger pain points than, you know, as entrepreneurs start to go quickly, there's a major failure point because it's very hard to take those hats off and start to build an actually functional organization and what that even looks like, you know, and starting to start thinking about some form of projections and starting to think about some form of EBITDA to then making that next jump to what I call the third pillar, which is the biggest failure point um, within the ecosystem where it's either failure or you, like you were you already describing earlier, companies that kind of just, they, they lose their trajectory and they kind of go sideways and get stuck because they're not able to make that jump to a scalable, hyper um, accountable, uh, you know, MBO objectives driven machine. Um, and, and what I loved about Jim Collins book when I was building Media Trust, when we're going through this hyper growth was in the beginning, there were so many of these awkward, you know, stages where we're going from, you know, crawling to walking to becoming a pimply faced teenager in our cycles. And, you know, I remember when the first few people leave and went, went to leave and people freaked out in the company, I got 
50 copies of that book made everyone read it. And they were like, okay, people get on the bus, people get off the bus. Some people will stay on the bus through the whole trip. Others at different points of the life cycle, because that's where their strengths are or their weaknesses are. And understanding as an entrepreneur, an operator and an investor, those cycles of where the company is and what it needs to do to get to the next cycle. I do believe there are constants in there that can be turned into an actual um, tool or platform that can help mitigate that friction and risk and really enable that, that trajectory that these uh, other companies and teams have had who are highly, highly successful in being able to execute, execute across those different life cycle stages. Um, and at, we have an enterprise software and technology for task management, Slack for communications, you know, big enterprise. But I don't, I, I just find that there's a, a huge gap in the market helping entrepreneurs, you know, scale their company up. And um, I, I actually, I got to, I was so excited. We were the Inc. 500 ninth fastest growing company in the United States. Um, and uh, we, I was going to get to go have lunch with Jim Cramer. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. I can't wait to talk to this guy. And I sit next to him at, at lunch and I start talking and we're like, Jim, like, how do you fine tune a dragster while it's going full tilt down the strip, not in the car, running next to it, tuning the engine? And he's like, and I was like, oh, give me all your knowledge. And he's like, it's hard, isn't it? Good luck. <laughs> and I was like, what? Come on. There's got to be, where do I get the knowledge to do that and understand it? You know, it's everything that you're not taught in school. You live in the real world or you live vicariously by cobbling together bits and pieces of all that information, which by the time I've, d I've done that, to your point, it's probably outmoded already because those business cycles are moving so quickly as, you know, markets are evolving and we become, you know, eventually we're going to have that right angle business model driven by will be the, the ultimate agile, you know, way, methodology of, of operating. You know, how do you do that? So it's, it's so fascinating. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating idea. I think you're really onto something there. And I feel it, we've definitely like this as an entrepreneurial community. And I was so excited the first time I came to Silicon Valley back in 2001. And I went to a random um, Starbucks in, uh, I think, Mountain View. And people were pitching their business plan to an investor. And I'm like, holy shit, the whole, I mean, all of Europe, I've never seen that ever. And it was like, you know, that, that was just a thing that happens every day. And there's like, it wasn't like a specific event. There were a bunch of people just randomly having a meeting and thinking about startups. So oh. I oh, felt well, I'm so that's, close. Sorry, that, that's changing dramatically. I mean, think about that, but where the world is now. I mean, I remember I had friends of mine that were in Europe that came here to go on the accelerators. Like, oh my God, this economy does not exist in France and then Germany or in Argentina. And what I love seeing now is they're coming here, having success, and now that is becoming, you know, decentralized um, as they go back into where they came from and they bring the capital and the knowledge that they have. And it's starting to, you know, we're seeing tons of uh, technology and innovation coming out of, you know, the UK and France and Germany and, you know, and companies that, you know, years ago when you came, it was like, well, literally, it's not even apples and oranges. It was like apples and very small rocks, you know, that, it just didn't uh, no, exist. Indeed, in the uh, so, yeah. so certainly Silicon Valley as a spur has gone to the cloud. And uh, you see that in many Bay Area communities where the, the mayors are very anti-tech and there's a huge feud between those two. And they, they really don't like each other. Um, maybe Palo Alto is still okay, but most Bay Area communities are extremely anti-tech as, as, a, as a wider part of the population. Well, maybe for good reasons. Um, I, um, big tech has their own issues, but I'm not a big, big fan of big tech. I'm talking, um, I feel like my, my, um, my, the reason I do this podcast is really to find out where will entrepreneurship be in the next 20 years and how can we encourage this? Because I, I feel this is the, the strong building block of an economy is entrepreneurship because it makes everyone's lives better, right? So we create products that other people are willing to try out and they find out they're better than what they had before and they're willing to give us money for this. So it's a voluntary transaction that makes everyone better off because otherwise they would just stop doing this voluntary transaction. Yeah, uh, this so is what creates the, the world. This is what creates productivity growth. But in <clears> the end, that's 
the, the person who invented the wheel was probably an entrepreneur. He wanted to make money. He wanted to do something about the transport and he changed the way the world works literally. And I think every entrepreneur has that same, well, it's probably more short term, but there's a long term invisible hand that makes entrepreneurship so important. And this lesson was pretty vibrant, I think, for the longest time in America. Now we've kind of lost that. We've lost that leadership. It's probably China is seems more open to entrepreneurship within boundaries than many places in the U.S., which is staggering to me. And yes, there is a lot of success outside the U.S., but it's really tiny bubbles and it's not a widespread um, change of the economy. So the European economy, while well, there's lots of startups and good tech, the European economies haven't changed much. And the GDP growth is very low, the productivity growth is low, and there isn't like a, it doesn't have to be a tech bubble, but it, there isn't a widespread adoption. So adoption of new technology is much slower outside the US. Still, the US has slowed down as well until COVID. So COVID changes a lot of things. So I feel like entrepreneurship is undervalued in, in the public discourse. Um, from my point of view. And my question is, how do we change this? And, you know, I think your idea that you just mentioned is fantastic because it really gives us an easy way to educate the next generation of entrepreneurs. And I fully agree, entrepreneurship isn't taught in schools. And so are many other life skills in school. And I think the topic you touch on is something of education. How do we take all this knowledge that is already out there and that people put on the internet mostly for free? How do we bring this into the minds of the next generation? And I see this with my own kids who are 13, so they're in a good age to really do uh, online schooling. But it's not the same in terms of output, in terms of what they learn, than the old school system, the, the in-person school. And I feel is, is what we are looking at is that like the first digital cameras who were kind of crappy compared to analog, but we knew that's the future. And we knew it has so much more potential because the education could be much cheaper and it's um, much more convenient for the, for the individual student. Are we looking at a complete change in how the education system works literally from the kindergarten age all the way up to 90 year olds? And isn't what, what you mentioned, isn't that a subsector of it where we feel like oh, this could be a beachhead because those are people really interested in knowledge. But we all face the same problem. The knowledge is out there. We don't know how to access it. We don't know where to look for. There's YouTube, but then there's like two hour videos like this one, but we are maybe only interested in the middle of it, a certain certain section of it. So how do we, on an atomic basis, access this knowledge in, in, and get it into our brains? Boy, that's such a, I'd love to unpack. There are so many micro, macro, fascinating aspects of what you just said. I mean, you know, one on the overall, one of the overall themes I'm extremely interested in is uh, of two, you know, one is, you know, um, simplicity is the new innovation, right? All these things getting broken up this simple, like Slack, what's that really, really simple communication, Asana, really, really simple task. Um, you know, um, Instagram, really, really simple does one thing, but at the same time, there's another theme, which is there's so much information that's out there. So I'm, I'm extremely interested in um, cloud platforms that provide cloud-based collective intelligence. And that, that collective intelligence by defragmenting all that information that's out there, whether it's uh, like fraud.net, which is a company I'm on the board of an investor in, has an incredible system. It's game-changing in how they're using AI the more people that plug into the system and the data feeds in, the smarter the system gets, arguably to one point where you're moving from um, a supervised to a non-supervised AI model, and it becomes self-learning and can just start identifying fraud in real time before it's even happening. Or, you know, going down to the entrepreneurial level, you know, solving the problem of that, there's a, there's a there's a fundamental problem in the education system, you know, as evidenced by my experience personally going into, you know, my uh, internship and coming back and being like, oh my God, there's my education and there's the real world and there's so much in between and they're so disconnected. You know, ha the, 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 the education system of today, and I think why so many people are not going to grad school, they want to go straight out in the real world, 
is because they see all that opportunity that's out there. And especially, you know, one of the things that's driving it, which is access to capital and the ability to create at such low capex. And we think about when we were first in the internet days, the average, you know, small e-commerce site cost millions of dollars to build, or even a website was $100,000. I can go build one for 500 bucks now. That the ability, the ability to conceive and manifest, that capex of being able to conceive and manifest is so incredibly low. I find in all my conversations with entrepreneurs from Europe and uh, like Argentina, the biggest problem that's been there is not the ability to create and build, it's been the access to capital because those systems have not changed to provide what we have here. Well, ho hopefully that's changing as entrepreneurs come here, they're successful, and now they're taking that concept of angel and earlier stage money. Um, I think that access to capital is one huge problem, those emerging markets, but that will be democratized hands down over the next 20 years. And then two, the way that we hopefully can look at revamping the education system so it's more connected to what I want to do in life and what, how, you know, helping, how, how do I, how does an entrepreneur become an entrepreneur, right? I had to, when you talk about that path and those things that happened to me, isn't that part of our education that's supposed to help me discover not only teach, this is what you're going to think, this is what you're going to do, this is going to be your path, but who are you? What are you interested in? You know, it's the, it, the concept when I first went was my senior year in high school, you need to know what your major is. And that's going to turn, you know, and I was like, my major, I have no experience. How am I even going to know that? And then going into college, you know, not having access to, I, I think one of the, the smartest things today that I don't, I didn't have then that entrepreneurs have today is mentorship, 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 because that mentorship helps cr close that gap between education, the real world, the building, and that those experiences that are missing in that uh, in that kind of experience, um, and then the ability to your point, there's so much of that collect that that knowledge that's out there. How do you take that collective experience and and get it in a in a way, or even into a process, or even a software system that enables you to help you guide you down this path, so that you can mitigate risk and friction points, and have the ability to build you know, without having to raise a ton of money. I think those are the things that are gonna really start to, you know, when we talk about in 20 years, where will where, where we'll finance look, those are the things that are really gonna to start to change um, the ability for companies to grow with that and, and not having to like get access to big venture capital money because they're gonna be so incredibly lean and efficient and understanding how to build without having to waste the kind of funds that are wasted now trying to figure it out. I think that that could be one of the biggest game changers in the next 20 years. Yeah, my hope is that we see these 9 billion entrepreneurs and not everyone has to be an entrepreneur all the time, um, every day. It's just once in your life, spread out over 80 years, there is one day where you're an entrepreneur and you create something completely unique that is helping other people to live their life easier. This could be as little as an app um, or maybe an addition you do on GitHub to someone else's code. But there's this huge potential of people who are not really plugged into this knowledge economy. And it's really easy. I mean, I don't want them to do only do this, but do this from time to time. And I think this whole idea of education is there's a lot of potential when we when we change this because on average in the US we pay between ten and twenty thousand dollars per student and that includes all the way to kindergarten, um, to high school students in our schools. There's a lot of tax money that I think we waste on traditional schooling um, because that knowledge is basically free. You only need to record the teacher's lecture, so to speak, on the non-interactive part once. Um, they only need literally one teacher per state or per city, depending on how customized the, the, um, the curriculum is. And then what you need is in a, in a homeschool environment, something that parents literally can set up themselves or there's, a, there's websites coming up like the Airbnb for homeschooling where you have a more interactive learning, where you, where you tell people, okay, this part is 
of interest. This is what you should learn. This is what you should look at. This is what I want to test you at. And then I want to check out that test later on. And I think this works all the way down to kindergarten and could go all the way up to high school. And it gives you social interaction, not as big a group, uh, not 30 people, but maybe five people, maybe 20 people, maybe 10 people. And it's, it's a very um, um, casual setup, so to speak. I think this is where the future of education could be because it would be extremely cheap. We're not talking about twelve to $20,000. we are talking about $500 to $1,000 per student in a much better education system. What we, the only thing we have to really solve for this, because the knowledge is already out there, you can go to YouTube and can do a psychology course, or you can do an arts course, or you can do a law uh, course, or I, I did a lot of history courses on, on, uh, from Yale. I thought it's fantastic. But all you have to do is create this serendipity. Um, there is only YouTube and a couple of recommendations. And I think we, we're almost there. Um, but if there's a lot of steps in between. Most of them are adoptions in, pe in people's minds. But there's a, there's a lot of tools already there that we can go completely virtual for learning if people had a chance to figure out. That's back to your point about the entrepreneurship um, curriculum or the corpus of knowledge. How can we classify this and make people already are interested? That's another problem, how to get people motivated and interested. But let's assume we can solve this. How can we let them go along a certain curriculum? And there's a bunch of online universities who do that, right? Who, who take kind of unsorted knowledge and bring it into a series of lectures. Maybe that's what's needed for entrepreneurship is literally online universities giving you two semesters, three semesters, just on entrepreneurship. Maybe case studies, maybe it's research, um, maybe it's data that comes out of Amazon and you know, kind of as a case study. I think you can pull this off in, in, in with good professors in an online university. It won't take a lot of money. I feel you can probably do that for, I don't know, a few million dollars. And then the question again is how do we market this? How do we get all the entrepreneurs in line to take that course? I think a lot of online universities have exactly that problem right now. They don't really know how to address this, this, this huge potential audience out there. How, how do you get the word out there? Uh, this is, I think, the, the biggest problem for most online universities. As you say, the content is basically free. And once you have the professors motivated enough to put it together and collect it, but how do you find someone who's interested in entrepreneurship? How do you connect with them and then make them pay for something they could get for free if yeah. they put a little more effort in. Well, and then I would say, how do you, you know, have the experience of the yin and the yang of education? Because there's the yin of the professor um, who is incredibly, you know, knowledgeable from a theory perspective that's teaching you, and then balance that out with the yang of someone who's actually in the world executing and understanding how those pieces come together. And I say that, I remember I was um, taking... I was at courses at Stern School of Business, and I had this big paper we had to write and was talking to a professor about, and I'd just come off of my um, internship and talking about what I wanted to write, and I kept saying, well, I want to write about this because that thing has no relevance <laughs> to what happens in the real world. And at one point, it got fairly contentious, and I turned to him and I said, how would you know, have you ever actually worked in the real world? So no. how can you tell me what to do? And I was like, uh oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but it was true. There was such a disconnect. And not that he was wrong or I was right or anything, but that, again, that disconnect between theory and principle, which has a lot of value, but the disconnect then from how that's applied in the real world or what, you know, what you're using and how you're using it. And that, that to me, would be extremely interested in to be able to to package that up, because um, there's so much knowledge out there. I mean, I literally, you know, and I, you know, then, you know, then the mentorship. You know, you would think that, you know, my father, one of his biggest weakest points was I went to him literally and said, "Teach me everything." You know, the, there's those failure points from Gen One to Gen Two, um, where Gen One um, entrepreneurs have a very hard time passing on what they what they. Uh, what they'd learned. And it was tough. I wish my, there were so many, and then there's, you know, Gen, Gen 2, me being a young, like, I'm going to go build a billion dollar company. And then my dad saying, no, when I was building my company, all I did every day was focus on making it operate better. And it grew on its own. And I'm like, what? 
fuck that. <laughs> I'm going to go to <laughs> another <my> company. <laughs> now I'm like, shit, I wish I had listened. <laughs> you know, those tidbits of knowledge, you know, and so they're more connected in a way that they're effective. And even, I don't know, even the te technology at certain points, it gives you access. Oh, you're at this point now. Here are the things you should be looking at from a professor or from guys who've been doing it. I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's, you know, we're still all just kind of wandering around as entrepreneurs figuring it out, which is remarkable considering how much enterprise value is being created now. And I, and I would argue over the next, you know, five to 10 years, like the industrial age, you know, we have really hit a point where this is going to get go bigger and broader and faster and global. And they're going to be, it's going to be, not that it hasn't been remarkable. It is really the, the, uh, the industrial age is here. One thing that COVID I, did was accelerate. Fully with you. I'm fully with you. There is um, this this drive now with COVID that we we had to change the way we we typically interact. And as bad as COVID is, this is a good thing. I feel because it makes ways to to interact and learn more scalable. And there's a couple of online accelerators. So literally, there's no in-person pitches. There's never any any in-person interaction. Daniel Grassi, he's on the podcast tomorrow. He runs one of them, Pioneer, and I think, I don't know if he has focused on this, but he might be a good source of knowledge to, to look into this because he, the entrepreneurs interact with each other, but I'm sure there is a, a body of knowledge about entrepreneurship, learnings, theory that everyone has to go through in order to complete the course, like a, before you get an investment from the accelerator. That would be that would be incredibly immensely valuable, you know. And a lot of them don't do that. I mean, uh, I mean, I love Y Combinator. I think they've done an incredible job in creating a very vibrant and important part of the economy. But I just go back to this young know, entrepreneur that I was mentoring. He got into the teal. His guy was remarkable. I mean, when he was you know twelve years old, he built a real estate website for his parents and, the, and then sold it for $6,000. And uh, I met him on Twitter. He's like, I'm going to come. Will you mentor me? Can I come intern at Media Trust? And he told me that story. I was like, you're, you're in. And then I got, I got to be a part of his journey as a young entrepreneur. And he got into the Teal Foundation. He got into Y Combinator. And it was just fascinating learnings for me to, to constantly keep talking to him about where he was, what he was doing, what was working and not working. Um, it was, uh, and, and, and he, one day he was in, in the Y Combinator program and all of a sudden just was in my office in New York. And I was like, John, what, what the hell are you doing here? And he goes, I, I couldn't take it anymore. He said, I just, what do you mean you couldn't take it anymore? He said, I just don't understand. You know, we have plenty of money. Why is it all we're focusing on is getting to demo day and we're talking to our customers, but I'm building spaghetti code that then I'm gonna to have to go rebuilding. And I don't need the demo day money, it'd be great. I wanna build a real product. And I told him, yeah. oh, that's so interesting. And he said, all we do is sit there, heads down doing that, and we have no time to look up, you know? And um, I thought that was very, very interesting. And I said, well, then don't they talk to you about once you've got that product live and you go to demo day, what do you do next? And he said, you know, sink or swim. It's an, it's just a math game. I do a yeah. hundred of these and two hit and I win. Here. Yeah, so I feel the individual in most of those Y companies, I never joined one of them and I only looked at them from the outside and I'm gonna to talk to, to Daniel Gross about Pioneer and I'm gonna raise that question. I think the, the individual it doesn't play a big role. The talents of an individual, it's its measured into, and as you say, the demo day, it's from the outside, it seems like it's, it's a pure numbers game. And it's a pure, it's throwing a lot of darts against the wall and hope yeah. one of the six. And for the, for the development of the individual, the question is what, is this bit like going to the military because you're, you're being de-individualized in the military, right? Nobody cares about you. you. You go into this role model and then you can go and succeed. Maybe, or maybe not. Most people won't succeed. Um, most Navy SEALs don't make it through the basic training. In fact, 99% won't make it. So it, maybe this is a necessary process. Um, and I, I feel, I always ask this question when I have people on what, what they, they feel, 
what role religion, especially the Old Testament, the monotheistic um, religions play in entrepreneurship. I feel a lot of things that we talk about, about entrepreneurship and on a higher abstraction layer, we see in the Old Testament. There's this belief in a better future, there's this covenant, there's certain rules we have to adhere to. It's, it's kind of a software upgrade to the human mind, and at least from my analysis. And what do you think happened to entrepreneurship outside of places not affected by the Old Testament? Do you think it, it was an advantage what happened um, with Christianity? And, and obviously it seems like it, it took off at that time in the 15th century at least. How do you feel the Old Testament fits into entrepreneurship? Now that's interesting. You think about that from I see where you're coming from on the on the uh, on that perspective. But I, from my my lens on it, I feel like it's more about Buddhism and in, in, with a hint of Hinduism because I think of more the you know going back to the theory that you know what makes a great entrepreneur is being able to think multidimensionally and you know seeing patterns, understanding them, but most importantly being able to act on them. And I would. I would venture to say that my my experience is um, more based on that ability to tap into whatever that sixth sense is or whatever you want to call it um, and being able to see things that, you know, those people who are just kind of surviving their lives or doing their, you know, you know, I'm 50 years or 20 something working at Time Warner and I've got my job and I don't need to think about anything different. Um, I view I view it more as that kind of more Luke Skywalker Hindu Veda, you know, tap tap into the Force um, kind of perspective than more of the old, the newer Old Testament perspective. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about Hinduism to be honest, um, <laughs> but I know a little bit about Buddhism. Um, but that that's that's it. What I what I know about the Oriental religions, <clears throat> but but. So, I, you know, what but is it from like, your I'd be curious on your perspective, you know, about from the what you're talking about, how you see that connecting connecting into it. That'd be an interesting perspective for me. Well, in, in my mind, we, we we should look at the success of monotheistic religions, and there, apparently there's something to it, right? The the the, the old original Old Testament the Israelites were very successful in in rolling over the same stories, uh, many of them were older than the, the original Old Testament. They were rolling them over, but sticking to them for a long time. So there must have been something to it that helps people enough. And often I think it's self-improvement. You know, the Old Testament is very much, you got to be the best version of yourself possible. So it's like a self-improvement book, if you, if you, if you want to see it that way. There's a lot of rules, but most people that, that play an important part in the Bible, they don't really adhere to the rules too much. They're like, okay, there's rules, but you know what? I'm going to do it differently, and let's see how this is going to play out. And over time, the, the, the Israelites, the culture of the Israelites survived a really long time. Most of religions, you know, they don't make it too long. Um, there's exceptions, Hinduism, for instance, <clears throat> or Buddhism, later on. And... Um, then it cut, catapulted into basically the rest of the world in Europe um, with Christianity, which I think is a bit of a parlor trick, but the same values, but, but kind of dumbed down, much better yeah. marketed, got exported to Europe and later on to the US and South America, Africa, everywhere. It, it really, it's still around and there's a lot of I mean, people who are part of the church and they see that it makes them a better person. Now we, we can argue what is a better person, but a lot of values like entrepreneurship, I wanna create something better. I believe in a better future. I believe in a future that is balanced between my individual needs and the, the needs of others, the society, and God is the one who makes that final judgment. It's not me, it's not the president, it's not uh, a person who's very worried about the climate. So Al Gore, no, it's gonna be God. So it's, it's kind of, it, it it gives you enough structure, it gives you scaffolding, but it is flexible enough to deal with pretty much anything that has come along since then. Now, the last hundred years are pretty special. They're kind of like the Roman Empire, we, 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 less and less people believe in religion and believe this is a useful scaffolding to them. But I, I see entrepreneurship as this, you know, it starts out of me and I create something for the world and artists have that too. Yeah. It's, it's very much 
like the Old Testament, if you if you if you're influenced by this, so it's a very Jewish idea. That's I find that fascinating because then I start to think of okay, well, how does that work? Where is what's the difference between a religious person and a spiritual person? Is religion the framework and the vehicle to spirituality? Um, and if you almost think about it, then you start seeing the mechanics behind that from corporate culture. <laughs> it's almost it's fairly similar in a way. I mean, if, you know, as, as Christianity spread and that aspect of religion, I mean, I would, I would argue that it just was teams that were able to market better, execute better, and, and basically commercialize it better. It's almost identical. I agree. I agree. Religion, religion became a business, right? That's yes, where it, yes, absolutely. And it yeah. probably always was. So I, there's no doubt about it. It's a self-improvement but, business, right? Yeah, people yeah. feel better. But to an extent, it is the opium of the masses, as Marx said. That's true, right? Okay. So, but this is like a very nihilistic view on that. That's yeah. that the Christians are much better marketers than the than the right. Israelites. Also, they had a different story but, to it. But don't but you think there's a voluntary that? transaction? You don't have to believe in God if you feel like, oh, it's not helping me. I tried out for a couple of years, yeah. and then a couple of years later, you're like, man, it didn't really help me. Yeah. Then you just give up on it. But the religion kept surviving, and you know, kept being sold properly. So. Uh, from my point of view, I think it's a survival help, and everyone should know it, and then should put their own layers of technologies, or so to speak, of belief on top of that. Yeah, I would, That's I would say, I would say that in the earlier part of that, this you know aspect of religion, it was one of the things that really changes when it became a business, where before it was truly you know religion as a vehicle to becoming a spiritual being, and then it be, and then as you know all the it, interesting sociological and psychological issues of, you know, Freudian issues of man, you know, it started to become a business because, you know, religion also became powerful and absolute power, you know, corrupts absolutely. And that, that aspect started to change it from where it became, was very extremely authentic. And like, we're all spiritual beings. I mean, I, I went through a phase in my life where I became fascinated with that. And I studied Catholicism and I studied Hinduism and I read the Hindu Vedas and Buddhism and traveling all over the world. And I said, God, it's so interesting. And, you know, I've spent time in Jerusalem and, and, um, uh, and I found that every single religion to me is like, we're all five people are standing at the base of a mountain. And I say, well, I'm going to take that road. That's the snowy mountain road. And you go, well, I love the beach. I'm going to take that road. And then you know, my friend on my left says, well, I'd love the city. I, I'm going to take that road. And then we take the road, but we all end up at the same point at the top, at the top of the mountain. And they all, because when you break them all down, they basically have the same quantum mechanics under underneath them. So why is it that, that what, what happened? You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't, I have trouble with the exclusivity that some religions apply to their own belief that it's completely exclusive and that's that's the end of it. That that, that I find that hard to 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 associate myself with. But what they definitely do is they increase trust, right? So the, the especially the monotheistic religions and that also works with Hinduism, if because no. th there's a few gods that in the end are have the majority of believers and majority of followers. So it's very, the effects are very similar there, but not as widespread. But the, the increase in trust is like the shared economy, right? It's, it's a kind of a free upgrade to, yeah. to trust in each other so you can specialize more. So obviously you increase GDP. And uh, that I think is very pronounced effect. And I'm curious about your, you, you, I want to hear your, your travel stories because I, I, I'm hesitant to sometimes go into deeper discussions when I travel with other people. Sometimes I don't speak the language. Sometimes talking about religion and politics is not a topic that goes lightly. Everyone's different. Like in Ethiopia, it's surprisingly easy, for instance. Everyone talks about it all the time. Um, but other countries, is kind of a no-no. In, in your travels, where did you go? And where did you feel you, you found a culture that's truly different or that's truly alien to you, that you but you were able to explore it and see, oh, that's really interesting and that's something that I could learn from. I think travel has been one of the greatest educations that's affected my life more than my traditional education and taking, you know, not, you know, after school in the United States, you get a year old pass and you travel around Europe for a couple of weeks and you come back, but going and actually immersing yourself and like living 
in places for weeks and understanding their culture. I mean, I've lived in Paris for a year. I've lived in Milan. I, uh, I spent a month in Kenya with a friend of mine who was uh, from an old expat Anglo, you know, old school Kenyan family. And we spent a month, he was a war photographer who had, he just quit after his sixth friend was shot. And he basically, we met in New York and he said, look, it was just a numbers game. It was gonna, you know, it was my number was coming up next. Um, uh, and we, he, I'm, a, I'm a big adventure traveler. I like going off in the middle of nowhere. I've done things like driven a boat from, you know, Nantucket to Venezuela for three months with my father off in the middle of nowhere fishing in places where you never saw people for days on end. Um, I like that. As I think that's another important part of like my learnings about me is that sense of adventure is what keeps that window of curiosity open. Um, so a few trips for me that were uh, incredibly eye-opening. I spent a month in Kenya. The three of us drove through the back, back, back parts of Kenya. Um, and uh, and then ended up on the coast in La, uh, on the coast in Mombasa, and then drove up uh, to Lamu, and then took a 15-hour Dow sailboat and lived for two weeks on an island in the middle of nowhere. And the experiences that I had along that way were absolutely remarkable. So much so, I mean, I didn't touch a phone, I didn't touch a newspaper, watch television. I was so disconnected from you know our lives back here, and this is right in the middle of 1999 in the boom, boom days before the internet went down. That, and I was so touched by it when I came back, I had a very hard re-entry for two weeks. I, I just, it was so eye-opening to think about what life was really about and what is really important because life there was cheap. Uh, I, one night we, I mean, I was pulling people out of a car wreck at one o'clock in the morning um, you know, with or the driver's daughter was beheaded um, and bodies strewn in the street. And while we're, you know, trying to find people who are alive, everybody's coming out of the woodwork and taking their wallets while I'm trying to take their pulses. And we're all running around with nine millimeter Glock pistols. And my friend's like, don't pull your gun. They're dead and they don't need their things anymore. And it was just experience after experience after experience like that. And then coming back to the United States and then literally being dropped straight in back into the startup culture here, I, I, it was very hard for me. I, um, I would get up at, at right in the middle of the day and just walk out of the office. My business partner's like, where are you going? And I just, <laughs> I, I can't do this anymore. This is not reality. You know, what I saw there was every day life, you know, life is hard. And I, uh, I mean, how much of a, how fortunate we are, we live truly in, a, in an amazing uh, bubble, but also how disconnected we are from that. I that experience, same experience in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, what an amazing culture there. Um, and then just kind of my, my travels throughout Europe, living in, you know, living in the difference between living in Paris and then living in Milan and, you know, in the languages and, 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 and cultures. And I think a lot of that, and uh, I took a lot of that, and even what we're talking about religion, I think one of the, um, going back to culture thing, I think culture and core values when, when I'm traveling or when I think about religion are really the, the core things that make, that drive um, not only organizations, but countries and cities and towns and families and, and and religion, you know, globally. And it was one of the things that I found when I was building my first successful company, when I applied all those learnings from traveling about the importance of culture and core values, the sense of belonging and purpose and community and being a part of something um, was game changing for us. Uh, it was amazing to see how those aspects and similar, I'd say, in the way that it's impacted religion and other experiences and places I've been, turned us into an unstoppable machine because of that belief system that we put in place. That being said, the other learnings that I had was that, you know, while we had one piece of the stack of a company, I always think of everything in the sense of stacks now. Um, the When we were growing hyper growth, we're talking to all of the 
venture capitalists and private equity guys are like, how the hell are you guys growing so fast? You guys haven't even deployed your, you know, the real hardcore technology innovation. Um, and, um, and I said, because there, this is one of the key parts of the pillars of an organization. But that being said, then I had realized that there were different pieces that were not fully aligned on how we were developing, what we were developing along with our brand, our culture and our core values. And, you know, my understanding today is of building a company that, you know, there are companies that evolve culturally and, and through core values like we were doing and building media trust. There are companies that, that uh, do it purely through tech innovation. There are companies like Zappos that do it through brand and customer experiences. And the, but the companies that are truly great, very sustainable companies are the ones that really understand and they align the full stack of all of those aspects from a brand. Like you think about Apple, when you go to a store, you buy something, till you open it, till you use it, they've aligned every single aspect you know, of the entire stack of that company. And I find that most companies, and this is one when I work with companies and I look at investing in, I look at where their stack is and how out of a line or, or not it is and, and trying to help them help them align that. And this also goes back to the systems and processes and or even a software program that helps you do that because it's so hard to do, put these moving pieces together in a place. And I think, you know, from, from all those learnings, going back to the beginning of our conversation to really a lot of what happened to me while traveling really helped me formulate a lot of these things by opening, giving me these adventure experiences that opened my eyes up to things that I would never have known had I not done that. And, and stepping into very uncomfortable situations like some of the ones in Africa and other places that I had that are near, you know, life and death or, you know, dealing with, um, you know, Somali bandits and yeah. crazy, crazy stuff like that, 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 that really enabled me to kind of shed the, the skins of what we're programmed to think and what this is what your life is going to be and take a step back and look back. And, and it, it was game changing for me and the way I look at the world, how I operate, you know, how I've gotten to where I am today. And had I not done those things, I don't, I wonder where I would be in my life right now. You know, all those things that we've been talking about all kind of really lead to, to that. And I, I, I would so encourage you know, everyone, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're someone working in a corporation already to, to take the time to be able to step out of your comfort zone and do things that you wouldn't normally do, because it really helps give you that perspective that we were, I think we lose in life, you know, because we're just kind of living our lives um, and we get disconnected from that. Um, I think that's been the most, the, the most in, incredible things that's come out of all my traveling to places I would normally not go and being off in the middle of nowhere, nowhere, Africa or other, you know, we didn't see yeah. people for days. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what you're describing, I call it positive PTSD. And PTSD is, is this, this syndrome when, when soldiers come back and they, they, they've done something or they've seen something, but usually it is what they've done where they were totally not expecting that they are capable of this. It doesn't have to be super negative, often it is. So it's an extreme margin of your own personality, of your own ego, the way you perceive yourself. And at that margin, I think we learn very quickly. We learn from literally just a few occurrences. We can, um, our, our model, our mental model of the, of the world updates very quickly. We don't need to do this hundreds of times. We do it once and we, we are literally a different person. And it's, it's, not as traumatic as PTSD and it's, it's, it's more positive, but it's at these margins that often we don't know that we are at the margin. We, we have to push ourselves into situations that are kind of risky, that are shaky, that are shaky. And maybe it's a bit of the hero myth. Um, so we have to go out there. We have to find that dragon. We have to be able to, to, to get outside of the community, take that risk, find the dragon, fight with the dragon, hopefully then come back and get uh, take, bring the gold back. So th this myth is still out there, but a lot of people, I think, especially in this comfortable society that coddles you with all this technology, it makes it harder for people. And it used to be a male uh, pastime. It doesn't have to be, I feel. It's, it's open to everyone. 
to go out there, see what you can do. And the, the, the benefit of this is not just that you shock your system and that you can show off to your friends. You create this confidence in yourself that you're able to accomplish things without all technology, as you describe it. But also it gives you this confidence that I've survived this, I've came out of this, and I'm still here, so I can deal with other things. So you, other people's fear mongering, and, and I think a lot of what today's society is, is people manipulating each other, usually for monetary gains, you know, advertising, we've always been very good at marketing in the US, but now we use the same skill, highly leveraged by AI, to just manipulate people all the, all the time in, in all, basically all directions just to monetize it later on. This could be for political gain, this could be for, for personal gain, so I get more attention. And this is much easier to, to push away and to keep your own sphere if you have those positive PTSD experiences. And I think what yeah. you described, that's not just to, to create your personality, where I think it's really important, but it also gives you this bubble of your own identity despite all the stuff that's going on that you read every day on social media and a lot of people have missed out on this and i think that's why they're so easily being influenced these days and they're very fearful and they're very depressed because they don't have things to really in their own core they're really proud of and they feel like no, i can take anything that's that nature can throw at me um or at least i can give it a shot i might not be able to survive but i ha i give it a shot and i i i I can live beyond this. And I feel that's a problem these days. And technology kind of created that problem, right? It, it, it made our life better, but we yeah. also become these big headed gray aliens very soon. I could not agree with you more on that. I mean, this is something, I mean, our, uh, with our, our nine year old, we really try and teach him to think, to be a critical thinker and don't take what you see is what you get because he's got access to so much information now. It's just remarkable. I mean, we're, we are truly finally in the middle of the attention economy. And to your point, it's a great thing because we have so much access, but at the same time, you know, we, we can't be sheep. We have to be able to learn to think for ourselves. And even when we're interviewing schools, going back to education, you know, asking like, great, you're going to teach them math and science and history. That's wonderful. What are you going to teach them to be a good steward of our planet? Because they are responsible. We are all responsible for the life of our planet and its sustainability. And how do you teach them to be a good digital citizen? Because now there is the physical me and the digital me, and they are not necessarily the same thing. And especially now that they have all that access. And to teach him then to not take things at face value and to be able to ask questions and do his own homework and be able to be able to be uh, a free thinker that can access this information to come up with hypothesis and, and, and decide what reality is for him versus the issues that you're talking about, which is now where it's determining people's reality. It's, which is very scary. It is, I think this last four years has been Hopefully one day someone will write a big paper, you know, paper about the sociological aspects of what just went on. But I think it just, you know, shows how like people are lemmings. You know, like we, what happened to modern man? <laughs> we, we haven't, we have access to all this information, and and I would say it actually it's been more counterintuitive. We've become more, we've become un unevolved um, because we're not able to think for ourselves and we take everything at face value. It's, it's, uh, I think the last four, four years have been shocking and appalling. The tools, the tools of propaganda have gotten really good and really cheap. Oh my God. So, it, so, so basically Twitter can run an AI, we, what you, we give you more stuff of what you like that might be interested in, and it can personalize this for like a billion users and it's free. So it's kind of like a perfect, tool to push people into their own but, but it's certainly it's a it's a mindset other people put you into because they want to sell you shit right they want to yeah. they want to they want you to vote for them or they want you to be angry and then watch more more cnn um the these things have gotten they've always been around i've just but when you watch soviet propaganda it's kind of stale right it's not very interesting people didn't watch it for long they're like okay it's really boring but now the propaganda has gotten cheap and really good. And I think what, what we have to do in our brains is, is you know, 
level up and realize, okay, this is just propaganda, um, not by a state actor, but by lots of little actors playing their own little propaganda game, where they're not clear with their intention and the fact. And our brains, maybe by the help of some AI, have to level up and kind of build a defense system against this. And I think that we're already in the, that stage that this is beginning, but it's rolling out slowly through the population. If you give it four or five more years, maybe that's the opposite, right? We are like, we feel like we have full control over ourselves and our own mind again. But right now, that's absolutely not the case, I feel. Oh, I mean, you think about bit, I think about what we're talking about now and then the idea of, you know, the, what religion and how it became a business, you know, big tech almost is a religion in a sense. There's so much, it's so powerful and all that data that they have and, you know, how that, that battle just that humans have in general with, you know, going back to simple concepts of where you are, what you eat and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it's very, very difficult to have so much power for good, and and I think most people trust all these platforms, and they think that they're being objective, and I, that is absolutely not the case. I mean, I've been in situations working with Yahoo and other platforms and the advertising, you know, side of the business, and we could we could absolutely see that things were getting manipulated on the other side. Uh, and when, it is, whenever it says trust and safety, I, you have to replace it with propaganda department. Yeah. That's <laughs> usually my shortcut, and I know like trust and safety. Okay, I can't talk to these people. They they're yeah compromise and I, I don't I wouldn't blame it necessarily in the tech giants they, I, th I really believe they didn't want to be in that game and they wanted to just build technology and eventually because they on their own they had a very progressive DNA they, they attracted a lot of activists and the activists obviously love it because there's a lot of leverage so they kind of got pushed by other people but this, this ship is way out of port. I don't know if we can get it back so maybe yeah. these, these platforms will not be able to change we have to create something new over time that will I think it will more protect our individual thoughts. So like an AI that pre-filters everything and kind of thinks like you, it's like trained on what you think are propaganda and automatically puts them in a dark hole and you never see it. Because then the whole incentive goes away. They only do this propaganda because they make money from it. But if propaganda makes less money again, then it's over. Propaganda won't exist anymore. We go back to facts. You know, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, it's not necessarily the fault of big tech, but then there are all the people then who start to access it and how they use it and the many different ways, like the fraudsters are constantly looking at different ways of manipulating, you know, and how cybersecurity, uh, how they're dealing with, you know, the more, as, especially as the more it gets digitally transformed, it just creates more cracks for um, people to get in, but that ultimately, you know, again, going back to the religion aspect of it, I find that to be a very kind of uh, Buddhist Hindu, you know, you know, Luke, you can take the, the light path or the dark path in the way that you can use that information, information which has been a, a human conundrum since the beginning of time of, of, of man, because we have free will and, you know, we're self-aware and things like that. And and, and used for good, you know, going to that point you were just making, and even even to the point you're making up earlier, which I absolutely loved, right? Uh, about being an entrepreneur it doesn't mean I'm going to build a six billion dollar company. It can build something as simple as a single app or an application that does good and helps change people's lives. There's so much good that can come out of it, and that goes back to my, you know, fascination with the ability to use AI and harnessing all that collective intelligence within that data to really affect positive positive change, you know, versus uh, the darker side of the way people are u using that information. And I, I, I'm very curious to think, I, you know, I think in that 20 year period, we're talking about, you know, what happens with the democratization of startups and entrepreneurialism. Uh, a big part of that, I think a thread's going to be dictated by, you know, what happens from a, a regulatory perspective too. I mean, when I was first getting in the ad tech industry and we were forming, uh, I was one of the founders that helped found the Performance Marketing Association because performance marketing, while it was huge, you're really not an industry until you have an organization um, representing it. And it was formed last minute around the beginning of the Amazon tax and and online tax and then quickly morphed into starting to deal with fraud and all these other issues. And um, it, it, it was an incredibly interesting experience going to Washington, D.C. 
and talking with regulators about, and because we'd always said, like, it's your fault. You should have been regulating this more from the start. You can't just now parachute in and just decide this is during 2008 and nine, of course, because all the states, you know, local and federal level, were looking for tax money. You're going to parachute and start taxing all these online marketers because you're, you know, you don't know what you're doing and you're going to actually cripple and take more money out of the system by shutting, because you're going to shut them down. Um, and, you know, having regulators trying to regulate something that they really don't understand, similar to that first day that Zuckerberg was talking in, in DC which I found to be horrifying because of the questions that he was getting. So to where, where I'm going with that is then, you know, what happens now in, in relationship to the threat that we're talking about? Do we self-regulate or do we allow, you know, what's going on with big tech or regulators to start coming in? What happens to media going forward? Because media, which I grew up in, has completely lost objectivity, everything has become so incredibly polarized with the pendulum swing and where you have, um, you know, Fox News with pictures of Donald Trump, but Jeffrey Epstein, where they photoshopped Trump out of the photo, is that, you know, like, where, where, where's, the, where's the line of what's right and what's wrong and our responsibility, you know, as creators, um, you know, will, will we be able to figure that out on our own, you know, uh, or will some new government body come into place and have to start regulating almost like it did, you know, in the 50, in the 50s media again, you know, to try and get rid of all that propaganda or fighting communism. It, it, it's a very interesting I, if you ask thing me, to think about. Yeah, I don't think regulation is the answer. I mean, it might happen or it might not. It's very hard to predict, but it won't be really the answer in the long term. And I feel these, these, these mega trends of how monotheism survived. Let's go back to the Old Testament or the capitalism and the entrepreneurship and the way it, it drove the the U.S. and the progress of a former British colony right in different proje- trajectory than the U.K. itself. It kind of took off and the U.K. gave up, kind of, so to speak, um, after the Second World War. And I think these trajectories are still intact. I'm, I'm not really worried about them long term. I, I think there might be a, a war period the next 10 years, um, and it might be there might be a war with China. But it's always the economy. When you look at these these global um, dynamics, the fastest growing economy always wins. And it's easy to grow an economy in the beginning. Once you get to middle income, that's where China is. It gets really hard. That doesn't mean China stops growing, but once the U.S. gets their own growth back, and it might not happen for another 10 years or maybe even longer, I think we are, we are safe. And something will come up that, that will fix that, that problems with media that we have right now. I think they're temporary. And I think they're pretty terrible, and they might get even worse. But I have a lot of hope that something will, and it probably will be some layer of technology, will fix that for us. I think regulation is just too slow, and you can always circumvent regulation relatively easily, especially if we talk about yeah. something like free speech, which is so hard to really define, because nobody really has free speech. We all self-censor, all platforms censor all the time, like Islamists are taken off um, the platforms right away, and have always been. But if you go full free speech, then we should have Al-Qaeda use a Twitter all the time, 24-7 for their propaganda, right? So there, there's always a limit to these things, and I just, we're we are all redoing our mental model because we are pushed out of this laziness. We 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 are in this you know positive PTSD period, all of us, and we we are redoing the learning in our mental mental model. Once this is done, I think we will be a much more effective society. Right now, it's very split, and nobody wants to go anywhere. Or like you know, there's like for some reason in the U.S. 50-50. There's a lot of progress on this side, and then it's a lot of progress on that side, and we all hate each other for another few years. Um, I think that's going to be a fix, but probably not the next four years or next ten years. It's fascinating. I I hope like I, regulation, especially since regulators have not proved to me, you know, uh, to have a deep enough founding under state understanding of what they're going to regulate. I worry more about regulating than self-regulating or things being able to basically, you know, as we go through these peaks and valleys, you know, kind of work them, work their ways out because this is all new territory for us globally. But, you know, the thing for one of the things you were talking about that I'm most interested in is, is the, you know, while the, 
the U.S. economy is is stagnating. Um, and one one aspect, it's really driven now the globalization and the more I'd say the level setting of the global economy and all these what were third world countries and economies now being able to through technology become more you know uh, level set in a way and they're emerging and gr and growth to where we become ultimately, I hope I get to see it in my life, like a truly synchronized global economy. You know, I love what the blockchain does to level set, you know, the micro macroeconomics around, you know, what is money and, and access to it. And um, I just, it's one thing I keep thinking about, like I, how long can I, hopefully there's a biotech company that can keep me going because I want to see what's going to happen in my son's lifetime. I think we're about to, in the next 20 years, see some just absolutely marvelous, miraculous things that I hope take us further into that right into that right direction versus the left side of the path. Um, I, 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 I have a question for you there. I have a couple of quick questions, so you can answer them with just a word or just a sentence. And one of them you, you're going to like, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And one of them is, do you think there will be a singularity as what Records will predict in 2045. I think the odds are far greater, uh, heavily weighted toward there being that, and and certainly in what we're seeing today, um, there are the tools and the technologies being created that would that would um, that would bode well for that singularity. I think it would be you know miraculous, you know, in a sense. But not in a George Orwellian kind of singularity with three different, you know, basically, um, you know, econ economies, but truly a glo global singularity, both from mo monetary and, but, and, but at the same time, I hope, I hope that that, that singularity doesn't uh, equate to homogenization. You know, one of the things after traveling a lot in the 90s and 2000s, even today, and you know, I see where, you know, where I hope countries and cultures, through that singularity, we don't lose those unique aspects of those things. Um, so, while well, yeah. there, I'm more, I think singularity is a positive. I hope that those, what I think of, not necessarily negative aspects, but aspects of it that they that they don't they don't affect um, us as human, you know, human beings, humanity, and our cultures to lose all those unique aspects of all these cultures. I'm hoping that that singularity actually unlocks value of so many things that I can learn from other cultures and things that I've never been able to experience before. I mean, I, I, an amazing story along those lines, I was in Australia and um, I was talking to an artist who does a tremendous amount of work with the Aboriginal tribes way out in the middle of nowhere, kind of like, you know, my experiences in the middle of nowhere in Africa, but even more so. Um, and he was describing his experience to me of those, of that art and those cultures and was telling me about how um, heartbreaking it is now. And I said, well, what do you mean? Why is it heartbreaking? And he said, well, because, and this is related to one of his projects, I'm working on the process of using the power of digital to capture the history of these cultures. They have so much information about science and health and wellness and medicine and health and well-being um, that we've never had access to. And I said, okay, but what's the problem? And they said, well, the entire history of these Aboriginal cultures has been handed down. There's always one storyteller in each, in each group. And that storyteller then has the entire history of that culture in them and they pass it to another person and to another person and he said but today all the kids want to get blue jeans run off to the cities and go work and this one tribe that i'm working with the, he is the last storyteller of his kind and when he dies all of that information will go away and i'm going to do anything in my power to use technology to capture that and preserve it and and, and allow people to have access to it. They've never, I'm like, oh my God, that's so fascinating. I want to see it. And that it's just, you know, so there's that singularity and the great things about technology, but then there are the other counterparts of it. And so we have hopefully, you know, like everything in life, we have to find a balance between the two of those. And that will be that constant 
pendulum swinging and the roller coaster ride that we go go on as we go towards that. And hopefully as we're getting there, it will become less and less bumpy. I, I have one, one last question. Um, because we be, that I think we gave up on the quick questions anyways, um, and the quick answers. But given that you have been, you know, you, you lived your life, I'd say, in, in, in different places, in different um, identities, so to speak. Um, what about, it's, it's more, phys, it's, there's more of a, there's a, there's a real, science approach to this but what is your gut feeling on do we live in a simulation and will we create our own simulations for maybe ourselves maybe for a whole ecosystem so it's the whole universe in the first place a simulation and kind of entrenched in that question do you think we will start building simulations of ourselves as an economy as a universe or, or just as an individual right to see is this for me? Um, I'm, will I be an entrepreneur? So kind of you live your life simultaneously um, in like thousands of different simulations. But it's, it's your, your, your mind that lives or feels like it lives in all of these simulations. God, that's just thinking about that scares me. <laughs> <Because> Sorry <laughs> I'm, about already, that. I'm already living in, I'm already you know, have my PTSD, hyper digital ADD, and I'm trying to think about more of me and what that would, what that would be like. And then I, it makes me think about, you know, with the, you know, will we eventually be a culture where I'm just sitting at home in my big comfy chair with my virtual reality goggles on ordering things that are being delivered. And we evolved as human to only have three fingers with big thumbs because all we're doing is this all day long and we don't need people anymore. And I, well, I think conceptually it's really interesting. I think humanity will always need more, you know, that singularity, that more of that, you know, um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think humans are weighted toward weighted toward being predisposed to being able to live that way, outside of the few who are entrepreneurs or who are, um, I mean, like you look at people like Elon Musk who are just you know, he's living multiple simulations. I don't even know how many simulations he's living in real life. I think it would be very, very, very difficult for people to, to live like that. I personally, um, I don't know how, I don't know what a functioning society would look like in that, in that sense. I wonder what the societal mechanism would be, be to facilitate that or need it. Well, it's kind of like the cloud now. Right, we, 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 we create our identity in the cloud. Obviously, it's just a small subset of, of our real life, but it gets bigger and bigger. And one of the premises of the internet, I'm not sure that's still true, was that we can be free. And this freedom means we, we, don't, we can try out a different online persona, the avatar, where we go back to, um, what was the name of that? Second Life. Yeah. So that was kind of the original science fiction idea that you create a most lifelike avatar, but it could be any kind of avatar, it can be a different sex, can be a different age, can be a different personality, all of those. And I, I feel it's something that our mind really craves. It's feel like we are born with this. So in my mind, we are already in a simulation and we, we are craving this so much because this is kind of where we come from. I would say for me, I understand it, and but it's probably not something that I would, I look at in the way that my nine-year-old does and I watch him playing Roblox and all these other games and he loves that, creating all these different characters with different looks and feels and becoming those and becoming those characters. And I wonder what that's going to mean for that generation and beyond because it seems to be something that he and his friends really gravitate towards. Now, is that a phase in his life now because of where he is, you know, societally and sociologically and psychologically, or does that actually become, you know, the more, I think the point that we're talking about, something that becomes a longer term sustainable, actually part of the way he is as a person. Uh, that's, that's, that's fascinating, you know. I mean, we're talking about technology truly, truly changing the, the possibility of, you know, who, who we are, who we wanna be versus who we really are. 
Yeah, there's a lot out there. I, I really hope we can do this again, Peter. I'm kind of running out of time. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, thanks for joining me. Uh, I enjoyed our conversation immensely. I'm not, I'm, as you know, I'm not good at the short answers, but I, <laughs> that's okay. that's I'll get okay. better for the next one. We should do a next one where it's just yes. one sentence answers if we can. We, we should re-listen to it in two years from now and, and yeah. see if something changed to the positive or to the negative. Yeah. Or maybe in six months from now, the world is going to be a very different one already. Well, I, I greatly appreciate the way that you you think and the way that you approach things and having these kind of dialogues. I don't think there are enough of, there are, there are a lot of dialogues about a lot of the same thing, but there are far and few of these types of dialogues that I've had with other people that really, I think, look, it's through so many different lenses of who we are, what we do, how it links into society, what does it mean, you know, what, is it, what does it all mean? And uh, um, they're, they're the conversations that I think that we need to be having substantially more of, and especially from an entrepreneurial perspective and, and understanding who we are and why we do what we do and ultimately thinking about what the net impact of it could, could be and the responsibility that's associated with that. Um, yeah, which I don't think necessarily as people are thought, thought about so much as you're going 10,000 miles an hour. So, yeah, I, I, pre I appreciate it. I enjoyed speaking. The, the honor was all mine. I really appreciated that, Peter. And it was definitely one of the best um, podcasts we've had so far. Right. Oh, well, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Peter, thanks a lot. Yeah, talk to you later. Bye. Bye-bye. 